Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is Gilbert and Christy Carmona. We want to share with you something very special that God's been showing us. God's been showing us about the judgment seat of God. And I was recently in a court situation, and I want to share with you what I learned about that case and what I learned from that case. And as I studied it more, I want to share with you what God showed me. First, let me tell you why I was in court. I'm an accountant and a tax preparer, and I have a client that is a family trust. The trust had some minor issues involving property that the trust owned. While the issues were minor, they required a district judge to resolve them. Normally, the appointed legal trustee would have been the person responsible to appear in the court proceedings, but he was unavailable, and he asked me if I could be present as the accountant for the trust, and I, because I could answer any questions that the judge or legal counsel had. I've been in court before. I've been in court for many different types of cases in my capacity as an accountant and in my capacity as a fiduciary. I've been a juror twice. Every time I'm in court, I'm struck at the immense responsibility that the judge and the jury have. I can feel the weight of what they're doing. As a juror, I felt the responsibility to do my job as well as I could. One time, as a juror, I was the jury foreman, and it was just extra weight added on to an already heavy caseload. The judge, they have the authority to render a verdict. Their verdicts are binding to all the parties involved. Judges have the ultimate authority. In superior court, sometimes the decisions of a judge literally are life and death. So I went to this court situation and I just they asked me to just wait and sit down and the two attorneys met and they were back in private chambers and they were discussing the different issues involved and their positions. And this went on for about an hour. And I just sat there waiting. They couldn't agree on a resolution. They would come out, they'd go back in. They'd come out, they'd go back in. They couldn't agree on a resolution. So they both decided that they needed the judge, that the judge was going to have to render a verdict. It was the only way they were going to agree. At that time, it went from me just sitting there waiting to court being called to order. Now, I really... I. I I, I want to. I'm, I'm telling you all this to just set it up to, to, so you can see what God showed me. Literally, court was called to order. The judge sat in his seat. Guards came in. The the court guards came in. One sat, or stood actually, by the judge. The other one stood by the door. Next to the judge, a clerk sat just below him. The attorneys took their seat. I walked in and they asked me to sit at a chair appointed for the witnesses. Then trial began. The attorneys took out their files. They took out binders. The judge took out files. The judge had a book on his desk. The clerk took out binders. The clerk had a file. And all of a sudden, at one time, everybody just opened their files up. And there was just a seriousness that happened. All I thought about is when God comes back, he's going to come back to judge all humanity. The Bible tells us that he's going to open his books and he's going to call his witnesses. I'm trying to relate to you what I felt that day. I actually felt the reality of God. I felt the reality of the judgment seat of God. I felt the reality of heaven and hell. I have no other way to explain it. It was so real to me. And all I thought about is, this is just a glimpse of what it's going to be like. Now, I know that some people are uncomfortable talking about the judgment of God. And some people are, they're distressed when the subject's brought up. But I'm here to tell you, we are here to tell you, that there's mercy and joy in God's judgment. And there's hope and mercy while there's still time and while there's still breath in our bodies. In Revelation 22.12, it says, Behold, I am coming soon, and I shall bring my wages and rewards with me to repay and to render to each one just what his own actions and his own work merit. God's returning soon, and he is a rewarder for those that wait on him. Psalms chapter 7, verses 
8 through 11. The Lord judges the people. Judge me, O Lord, and do me justice according to my righteousness, my rightness, my justice, my right standing with you, according to the integrity that is in me. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end and establish the uncompromisingly righteous, those upright and in harmony with you, for you, who try the hearts and the emotions and the thinking powers are a righteous God. My defense and my shield depend upon God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge. Yes, a God who is indignant every day. And God is indignant with evil and the wickedness of the world, the evil and the wickedness of this present age. But he is a righteous judge. He weighs out and sifts each person. Do not be caught up with the evil of this present age. Ask God to help you. Ask God to prepare you for his coming. Then in Malachi chapter 3, Verses 1 through 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, the Messiah, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And let me stop there and say, that's when I was in that courtroom that day, that's what I, I thought about and I kept thinking, This is just nothing. Who can endure the day when God opens the books? Back in verse 2, And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and he's like fuller's soap. Verse 3, He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the priests, the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord all, offerings of righteousness. We are priests of God. If you claim to be a Christian, you are a minister and you are a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a son of Levi, a royal priesthood of God. God will deal with you as a true son. It says in Psalms, he'll deal with you as a true son and he will refine you. And we want to be refined so that we can be holy and we can serve God in holiness and righteousness. That is possible with God. In Psalm 70, uh, chapter 78, verse 7 and 8, you, even you, are to be feared with awe and reverence, who may stand in your presence, who may stand in your presence once your anger is roused. You cause sentence to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. And the entire earth will hear the sentences of God. They'll hear the sentences of his judgment. The Bible says all earth will hear. No one will be exempt, all who lived and all who are living. The fear of God will be known to all people. But the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. So there's hope in the fear of God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. I will strike her children, her proper followers dead, thoroughly exterminating them. And all the assemblies, the churches, shall recognize and understand that I am he who searches minds, the thoughts, feelings, and purposes, and the inmost hearts. I will give to each of you the reward for what you have done, as your work deserves. God will search all humanity. God will search all peoples. Um, He's not just a judge, a punisher. He's also a rewarder. Psalm 62, 10 through 12. Trust not in and rely confidently not on extortion and oppression. Do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice have I heard that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belong mercy and and loving kindness, for you render to every man according to his works. When I read this scripture, I think about where Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You'll love one, you'll hate the other. So only trust and rely on God and his son, Jesus Christ. He's the only true master. Riches, they'll be gone. 
but God and his word and his judgments are going to stand forever. Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. Why do you criticize and pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you look down upon or despise your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every tongue will acknowledge him to his honor and to his praise. And so each of you shall give an account of himself. You're going to give an answer in reference to judgment to God. God's not going to ask you about that brother that you're judging. God's not going to ask you about your neighbor. God's not going to ask you about all these other things that we occupy ourselves with. In the day of judgment, it's going to be you and God. You're going to be standing before him. And there's only one account you're going to give. And that is the account for you. And only you. So don't criticize your brothers. Because in the last day, they're going to have to stand up to judgment also. But help your brother. Ask God, how can I help that brother? How can I help that neighbor? Because the only thing you're going to take with you are the people you've helped, the lives you've helped. Ask God to help you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3.10 According to the grace, the special endowment for my task of God bestowed on me, as a skillful architect and a master builder, I laid the foundation, and now another man is building upon it. Let each man be careful how he builds upon it. And then Paul went on to say in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, So do not make any hasty or premature judgments before the time when the Lord comes again. For he will both bring to light the secret things that are now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose and expose the secret aims, motives, the purposes of heart that every man will receive his two is due con, con, that's a <laughs> let me say that again then every man will receive his due commendation from God God will expose all things to all people there is nothing that can escape from him there's nothing that will escape from him he sees all darkness he his light will pierce all darkness there's no secret too deep that's going to be kept from God. So be honest and open with God. Be honest and open with God while it's still called today. And you still can be. Because once the judgment of God happens, once those books are opened, it's going to be too late. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 to 15. And this is the scripture that I just kept thinking about that day in court. I just kept thinking about it. I also saw the dead... Great and small, they stood before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged, sentenced by what they had done, their whole way of feeling, their whole way of acting, their aims, their endeavors, in accordance with what was recorded in the books. And the sea delivered up the dead who were in it, death and Hades, they surrendered the dead in them, and all were tried, and their cases determined by what they had done according to those motives and those aims and those works. Then death and Hades, they were thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found recorded in the book of life, he was hurled into that lake of fire. And after seeing what I saw that day in court and experiencing that and reading these scriptures, I really believe that this is exactly how it's going to be. God is going to come. He's going to stand before that bench. He's going to be at that bench and he's going to open those books and the guards, the angels of God will be there. Witnesses will be called and God is going to look at you and he's going to say, give an account for your life. What do you have to say? We want to go to heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven like? We can look in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 12. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, thoughtless, without forethought, 
and five for wise, sensible, intelligent, and prudent. And prudent means acting with or showing care and thought for the future. For when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil along with them, also with their lamps. While the bridegroom lingered and was slow in coming, they all began nodding their heads and they fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then all of those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, There will not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the dealers and buy for yourselves. But while they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. And like Gilbert was talking about in the courtroom, when the judgment set, it's too late. But later the virgins, the other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he replied, I solemnly declare to you, I do not know you. I do not, I am not acquainted with you. And this to me would be awful for God to say that he did not know me, or that he was not acquainted with me. And I had a family member tell me one time, Christy, you think about heaven and hell every day? That's torture. I was like, no. The torture is standing before God on judgment day and having God saying, depart from me. I never knew you. That's torture to me for eternity. And, you know, thinking about thinking about heaven and hell every day, it says in 1 John 2, 8, and now little children abide, live, remain permanently in him. That's every day. Remain permanently. That's every moment. So that when he is made visible, we may have and enjoy perfect confidence, boldness, assurance, and not be ashamed and shrink from him at his coming. So there's another example about the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 22, verses 2 through 8. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding, wedding banquet for his son and sent his servants to summon those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they refused to come. Again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who are invited, behold, I have prepared my banquet, my bullocks and my fat calves are killed, and everything is prepared, come to the wedding feast. But they were not concerned, they paid no attention, they ignored and made light of the summons, Treating it with contempt, they went away, one to his farm, another to his business. They didn't take it seriously. They, it's like we go about our day, go about our business, go about what we have to do every day. There's no forethought for the future. But we want to have that forethought. We don't want to make it light. We want to have, it said that prudent, the wise virgin had thought for the future. They were with care, it says that these were not concerned. They didn't care. They ignored it. So in verse 6, it says, While the others seized his servants, treating them shamefully, and put them to death. Hearing this, the king was infuriated, and he sent his soldiers and put those murderers to death and burned their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is prepared, but those invited were not worthy. But we want to be found worthy. We want to be found worthy to make it to heaven. So they, the um, king said, go to the thoroughfares where they leave the city. Invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out to the crossroads and got together as many as they found, both bad and good. So the room in which the wedding feast was held was filled with guests. But when the king came in to view the guests, he looked intently at a man, at a man there who had on no wedding garment. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without putting on the appropriate wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, 
tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. There will be weeping and grinding of teeth. What is that appropriate wedding garment? It's letting Jesus cleanse us. It's like in Malachi that Gilbert read about the refiner's fire. Are we letting Jesus refine us? Are we letting Jesus do that work in our hearts? Are we, let, are we having oil in our lamps like the wise virgins? Are we ready? For in Matthew 24, 44, you must also be ready, therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful, the thoughtful, and the wise servant whom his servant, I'm sorry, whom his master has put in charge of his household to give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom, when his master comes, he will find so doing. And I want to be faithful. I solemnly declare to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked but if that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is delayed and is going to be gone a long time. See, no thought. I'm just doing what I'm going to do every day. I don't think about anything in the future. Jesus isn't coming back. He's going to be a long time. It says they weren't taking it seriously. They, he had, they have no forethought. And they begin to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. You know, it also says about the, the coming of the Son of Man will be like the days of Noah when they're just going about their day-to-day -day business. So the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour of which he is not aware and will punish him and put him with the pretenders, the hypocrites. We want to be real. We want to be true. We want to be faithful because the pretenders and the hypocrites there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. So in Luke 21, keep awake then and watch at all times. Be discreet, attentive, and ready, praying that you, have, that you may have the full strength and ability and be counted worthy to escape all these things taken together that will take place and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Amen. 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 That... Whenever we read that scripture about the oil in your lamp, I always think about what is the oil that I have in my lamp. And it's, uh, God has shown me that it's in every situation. What is that oil in your lamp? We want to have that oil in our lamp to be ready in every situation to be a minister of God, to, to, to bring Jesus into that situation. That's the oil we're bringing into the situation. But we've got to have oil in our lamp. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, look carefully then how we walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity, for the days are evil. And all you have to do is just a, a brief look at the news, the news, the local news, our national news, global news, and you can see the times are evil, the times are wicked. We are living in evil times, and we're in false shape. We're in foul shape as a people. We're in foul shape as a country. We're in foul shape as a world, as a race. But Jesus can help us. Yes. And only Jesus yes. can help us. Right. We look at the corruption in Washington. I was sharing with Douglas the other day, and Douglas, who's done many of these programs, Douglas said the only solution to the problems in Washington, the only solutions to the corruption, the wickedness, the, the lust, the greed that's there is the return of our Lord Jesus. Nothing else is gonna change that. No, no bill, no, no tax bill, no spending budget, no new law is gonna do anything. Only God 
coming back. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 7 through 10. For we walk by faith and not by sight or appearance. We have confident and hopeful courage and are pleased rather to be away from home, out of the body, or be at home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we are at home on earth away from him or away from home and with him, we are constantly ambitious and we strive earnestly to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive his pay according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, considering what his purpose and motive have been and what he has achieved, what he's been busy with, what he's given himself to, and what his attention has been, what he's given his attention to accomplishing. And Paul wrote this from some real first-hand insight. You know, he was arrested. He was in the courtroom a little different than I was. He was arrested, and he knew the reality of the judgment seat of God. He knew what judgment meant. And he's telling us, be careful. What is that oil in your lamp? What are you doing with the time that you have? What are you trying to accomplish? What is in your world? What are you allowing in your world? 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide, live, remain permanently in him, so that when he is made visible, we may have and enjoy perfect confidence, boldness, and assurance not to be ashamed and shrink from him at his coming. And earlier when I said there's joy and there's hope, in the judgment of God, and God judging us now while we're here, while there's breath. That is the reward that we want. I want to walk up to that judgment bar of God confident, yes. with hope, not to be ashamed, and not to shrink back. We, Our pastors have said, can you really say, come Lord, come? Can you really sit there and say, Jesus, please come back now? If your heart's ready and you're right with God, you can. But if you're, if you're not, you can't. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to shrink back from his coming. And Revelation chapter 22, verse 13 and 14. Now I read, earlier I read Revelation 22, 12. Now let me finish with the joy and the hope. 13 and 14. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first. I'm the last. I was before all. And I am the end of all. Blessed. Happy. And to be envied. Are those who cleanse their garments. Yes. The wedding gown. Yes. Who cleanse their garments. That they may have the authority. And the right. To approach the tree of life. And enter through the gates. Into the city. That is the good news of the coming of God. His judgment is to prepare us here on earth, to prepare the earth, to prepare all of us for him so we can all enter through the gates of heaven where we want to hear, well done, yes. good and faithful yes. servant, enter into my rest. rest. And that's the same tree of life. When you read in Genesis 2, 9, when Adam sinned because he partook of the tree of knowledge, there was still the tree of life. And God said, banish him from paradise because that's next. And see, it wasn't the appointed time. So Adam and Eve were removed and he put an angel to guard the tree of life. But the day's going to come when we're all going to be able to walk, enter through the gates of that city. Well, thank you for being with us today. I hope we've encouraged you. We are here at WCAB every Monday, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 
from 8.30 to 9 o'clock, and you can listen to all our other programs on wordoffaithfellowship.org. Thank you.